Hypersensitivity. This is a term that is used to describe immune responses that are inappropriate, either because they are of too great a magnitude or they're a response to something that we really do not need the immune system to respond to, or they're occurring at a location in the body where we shouldn't be getting that type of immune response. So hypersensitivity is an exaggerated or inappropriate immune response leading to pathology. I think it's quite important to understand that all of the responses you will be looking at are actually normal immune responses. The problem is they're being directed to something that isn't going to cause you any harm whatsoever, or they're taking place in a location in the body which it's not necessary for that type of response to be occurring in, or they're very exaggerated. We can classify hypersensitivity reactions into one of four different types. Type 1 is IgE-mediated mast cell degranulation. Type 2 is cytotoxic antibodies against cell surface antigens. Type 3 is immune complex-mediated hypersensitivity. And type 4 is delayed type hypersensitivity mediated by T cells. So note that types 1, 2, and 3 were all mediated by antibody, whereas type 4 is mediated by T cells. So we're going to look at each of these four different types, and I'll explain to you exactly what's involved in these different types of hypersensitivity reaction. So type 1, IgE-mediated mast cell degranulation. So here we have a mast cell, and on the surface of mast cells are FC receptors that are specific for the IgE class of antibody. This is in fact the high affinity IgE receptor that's called FC epsilon R1. So this will bind IgE antibodies by the FC region of the antibody. That's why it's called an FC receptor. And we all have mast cells sitting in our tissues that have IgE on their cell surface, and it doesn't cause any problems at all. The problem arises is if an antigen comes in, which the IgE is specific for, and that antigen binds to the IgE. Because what happens then is that the IgE antibodies on the surface of the mast cell get linked together. We use the term cross-linked. And if this substance is a completely innocuous substance, for example, grass pollen, we refer to it as an allergen. It's going to generate allergy. And the consequence of the IgE antibodies being linked together by the allergen is that the mast cells release their granules. They degranulate. Type 2 hypersensitivity is cytotoxic antibodies against cell surface antigens. So here we have a cell surface with some antigens present on the cell surface and antibodies are bound to those antigens. Sometimes the antibodies can be directly toxic to the cell. However, in most cases, other components of the immune response are required in order for these antibodies to actually damage the cell. So for example, the classical pathway of complement may become activated, leading to the production of the membrane attack complex, or killer cells, that is any cell that is able to participate in ADCC. So this term K cell is used as a generic description of cells able to participate in ADCC. There's only two things you need from a cell to do that. You need it to have an FC receptor and you need it to be able to produce toxic molecules. Or macrophages that again have FC receptors on their surface and are able to uh, attack the coated cell. Type 3 hypersensitivity is immune complex mediated hypersensitivity. Now, all that term means, immune complex, is simply an antibody bound to an antigen. And, you know, that's what antibodies do, isn't it? They bind to antigens. 
But in this situation, there is a binding to an inappropriate antigen or immune complexes are becoming trapped in small tissue spaces in the body and causing pathology. So for example, macrophages can become activated, complement can become activated, there will be recruitment of neutrophils if complement component C5A is generated because that's a very potent chemotactic factor for neutrophils and pathology will ensue. And then finally, type 4 hypersensitivity, delay type hypersensitivity. It's called delay type hypersensitivity because it takes a little while to get going. The other three types, you can have antibody that's already present. And as soon as the antigen comes into the body, the response will happen immediately. For T cells, you need them to expand up in number, to proliferate, to differentiate, and to so start secreting cytokines. So typically, type 4 hypersensitivity takes two or three days before you actually see any effects. And there is recognition of peptide MHC class 2 by the T cell receptor on a T cell that is going to mediate this hypersensitivity reaction, most commonly by producing excessive amounts of cytokines. Right, now having given you a little overview of those four different types, let's now look in a bit more uh, detail at each one. So type 1 hypersensitivity, IgE-mediated mast cell degranulation, you've already seen this picture. So these type 1 hypersensitivity reactions, IgE-mediated mast cell degranulation, that's what we usually think of as allergic types of responses, allergy. And this type of response, often referred to as atopy, an inappropriate production of IgE antibodies, is caused by a multitude of different factors. Genetics is important, but other factors also are important. Regarding the genes, there is not a single dominant allergy gene. It's rather that several genes contribute to the development of the allergic process. Amongst them, the gene encoding the FC epsilon R1, the gene encoding the cytokine interleukin-4, which is very important in causing B cells to class switch to IgE production, CD14, HLA-DR, there are a number of different genes. So it's really the combination of genes that's important, not any one single specific gene. And of course, the environment is also very important. It's not a purely genetic situation we have here. And early microbial exposure and early allergen exposure, perhaps in the uterus, seem to play an important role. Immune responsiveness overall is abnormal with a decreased production of gamma interferon and perhaps overall a more Th2 type of environment with those Th2 cells that secrete cytokines such as interleukin-4 and interleukin-5 and interleukin-6. They're, they're the more dominant population. And remember, all of these responses are normal responses. So a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction is based upon something that is a normal protective immune response, for example, against a parasitic worm infection. If you have a parasitic worm infection in your gut, for example, you'd be very grateful to having this sort of response because it would help expel the, wor the worms from the gut. However, in a substantial minority of individuals, IgE-mediated mast cell degranulation occurs in response to what should be a harmless environmental antigen. I mean, after all, grass pollen, it's not going to cause you any harm, but in a significant number of people, there's a response to this that actually leads to pathology. Maybe you yourself suffer from allergies. You'll certainly know people that do because it's a very common uh, affliction of people to suffer from these allergic reactions. In type 1 hypersensitivity, there's an immediate IgE response. But this resolves within around about an hour. However, it is frequently followed by what is referred to as the late phase reaction. This occurs around about 4 to 12 hours later, and it involves CD4 positive helper T cells, monocytes, and eosinophils becoming activated. So there are a number of different types of atopic allergy, that is allergy caused by excessive production of IgE. Rhinoconjunctivitis, which you may know as hay fever, affects around about 20 to 35 percent of individuals. Asthma affects around about 10 to 20 percent of individuals. Atopic eczema, again around about 20 percent of individuals. Urticaria, similar kinds of numbers. 
Food allergy may be around about 3 to 5% of individuals develop food allergy and insect venom hypersensitivity in about 1 in 100 people. We use the term anaphylaxis to describe a severe systemic hypersensitivity to allergen in an injection, a sting, or by epithelial exposure, for example, in the gut mucosa. It involves a rapid vasodilation, which leads to a substantial drop in blood pressure. There is constriction of the airways, edema, and anaphylactic shock can result that is often fatal. However, immediate administration of epinephrine can reverse the bronchoconstriction and vasodilation and rescue the patient. Let's have a look at some of the mediators that mast cells produce that contribute towards the inflammatory process. We can divide these mediators into two groups. Ones that have already been made by the mast cell and are stored within granules within the mast cell. And then newly synthesized mediators that are made from arachidonic acid. Histamine is the classical mast cell inflammatory mediator. It causes smooth muscle contraction and an increase in vascular permeability. Heparin is produced and stored in granules and this is an anticoagulant. And xenophil chemotactic factor is a third example of a pre-made mediator stored in the granules. And this, as its name suggests, mediates xenophil chemotaxis. So all these substances are ready to go. And the second the mast cell degranulates, they can mediate their effects. Regarding the newly synthesized mediators, prostaglandin D2, prostaglandin E2, and prostaglandin F2-alpha, can mediate smooth muscle contraction and increase vascular permeability, just like histamine. Leukotriene B4 is a chemotactic factor for neutrophils. And leukotriene C4, D4, and E4 cause smooth muscle contraction and vascular permeability, again, just like the prostaglandins and the histamine. Let's look at how the leukotrienes and prostaglandins are synthesized. They are both produced from phospholipids by the use of phospholipase A2 to generate arachidonic acid. Then, either via the lipoxygenase pathway, which produces leukotrienes, or via the cyclooxygenase pathway involving COX-1 and COX-2, which produces prostaglandins, these mediators are generated within the mast cell. This is a list of allergens. You'll be very familiar with many of these, I'm sure. So they include things like pollens, things associated with animals like animal dander, uh, house dust mites and so forth, molds, various chemicals, and a number of food allergens. I've already mentioned that genetics are important in the development of allergies. So let's take a couple of minutes to look at some of the genes that have been identified. Polymorphisms of genes encoding pattern recognition receptors have been described in patients with allergy. So have polymorphisms in the gene encoding the cytokine thymic stromal lymphopoietin. Polymorphisms of the MHC, particularly HLA-DQ polymorphisms. And polymorphisms in the transcription factor SMAD3. Other polymorphisms that have been described are ones for the genes encoding the interleukin-2 receptor beta chain, and indeed for the cytokine itself, interleukin-2, as well as polymorphisms of the genes for the interleukin-33 receptor and for interleukin-33. And as these reactions get going with the dendritic cell stimulating Th2 cells, and with the involvement, perhaps, of induced regulatory T cells trying to dampen down the allergic response. If the balance goes towards the development of an allergic response, 
The Th2 cells will become dominant with the production of cytokines such as interleukin-4, interleukin-5, interleukin-13. Eosinophils will be stimulated. B cells will be stimulated. Those B cells will class switch to IgE production, differentiate into plasma cells that will secrete the IgE antibody that is so characteristic of the type 1 hypersensitive T reaction. This will then bind to the uh, FC Epsilon R1, the high affinity IgE receptor, and maybe you won't be too surprised to hear that polymorphisms in that particular receptor have also been linked to the development of allergic disease. And again, mast cells, just like Th2 cells, have a receptor for interleukin-33, and therefore that polymorphism is acting at several different levels during the allergic response. And again, TSLP is influential in modulating the activity of mast cells, just like it can act on dendritic cells.